the best way to start a YouTube channel is knowing your who and your what. Who is this content for? Um, and what problem does it solve? And so the hook grabs the right audience and then you deliver some good information. As long as it's audible and it's somewhat coherent, especially, and here's the key, if it just solves the problem, then you're gonna create so much goodwill in the process, no matter what you look like, what you sound like. And then ultimately you gotta just start. You cannot steer a parked car. What is up, Action Taker? Welcome back to the After Hours Entrepreneur, where we are helping you get to your first six-figure year. I'm your host, Mark Savant, and I'm thrilled to bring you Sean Connell, the founder of Think Media. Sean's YouTube channels have nearly 3 million subscribers. His videos have been viewed hundreds of millions of times, and he has a huge infrastructure for helping you reach your perfect client with YouTube. He has the formula to help you leave your day job and focus on YouTube. Today, I've been diving into his book, YouTube Secrets, the second edition, and the book is bananas. We're gonna be getting to some of the nuts and bolts of the book, some things that you need to know to overcome imposter syndrome, to find the perfect niche for your YouTube and media presence. Um, before we get into that though, Sean is going to get really open about his story, about how he built his business. And if you think that you're in it alone, if you think that it's all just sunshine and rainbows, it is not. Entrepreneurship is tough. And he's going to share some of his biggest challenges and biggest lessons in building his now seven figure media empire. You do not want to miss out on this. You do not want to miss out on future episodes to help you build your six figure business. Hit subscribe right now. Now, hit the subscribe button and we are gonna get into this episode with Sean Cannell. DJ, run the tape. Mr. Sean Cannell, what's up? Man, Mark, I'm fired up to be on the uh, show today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, pleasure's all mine, man. I've been try I've been looking forward to this day for about four years, so my heart is pumped a little, a little bit nervous, but I'm excited to get into it, baby, because you really put yourself out there, you give the goods, and um, yeah, I'm ready to get into it if you are. Dude, I am absolutely pumped. It's been since Clubhouse that I think we uh, first met and hung out back at the Genesis when that was all exploding, and I'm, I'm glad we're able to do a deep dive like this. Yeah, man, Clubhouse is kind of falling out of favor, but YouTube and video is blowing up. So that's really what I want to work on today is helping young entrepreneurs, business owners leverage these tools to explode their business. I want to kind of start from the beginning, though, right? Uh, in the beginning, Sean Cannell, working on producing videos at church, kind of like as a hobby at the time, right? So I'm curious, how did you turn that hobby into a thriving business? Loaded question, I know, but how did you turn that that uh, video hobby into a thriving business? Yeah, you know, um, I sometimes think that uh, is my faith that, that God kind of is working behind the scenes in our lives, and I quite literally volunteered at a church, I didn't really pursue video. It's like video pursued me because I'm an hour north of Seattle. I'm 20. I'm coming out of one year of Bible college. I had just gotten expelled from a Christian high school. So my journey was kind of interesting. And I just started volunteering in this tiny church. I mean, it was growing, but there was like eight kids in the youth ministry and the youth pastor handed me a Canon HV 30 with mini DV tapes in it, like a camcorder and Adobe Premiere, like 1.0 back when Adobe Creative Suite would send you all the CDs, you'd get the D or DVDs and that's the software to be on there. And you'd have to, you know, it took seven hours to install your software and your PC. And I just started to get into video. And of course my videos were terrible. This is 2003, but um, the repetition of it, because I was making videos every single Wednesday for my youth group in 2003. Now that's 52 videos a year. So I was having the blessing of developing a content creation muscle. You know, these days people are trying to juggle life and family and kids and business and entrepreneurs are trying to do all the things, the books, hiring, firing, whatever it is they're trying to do. And they're also like, Mark, you're telling me to create content. Well, it's like a muscle to grow and eventually it kind of can become second nature. So I was working on that muscle before technology was anywhere near as good as it was today. This is 2003. And then fast forward to 2007, we started a YouTube channel for 
our local church. And that was at the inspiration of the pastor, not me. Even though I'm an elder millennial now, I'm going to turn 39 soon. It was his kind of idea. He went to a couple cool conferences that had him thinking ahead. He started a Twitter account. I thought that was ridiculous at the time. He started, he wanted to start a YouTube channel. And we actually started a vlog for that pastor uh, where I was kind of filming him, kind of reality TV uh, show style. So to answer your question, by 2009, I started my own business, opened up an LLC called Clear Vision Media, and with the skills I had developed from being self-taught, but from really being in the entrepreneur school of I'm going to study, learn, read, go to conferences, do whatever I can to develop my skills and practice a lot, I began to do video as a freelancer for the YMCA, local baseball teams, local Mexican restaurants. And so pre really even getting into YouTube, the key skill and what I'm still teaching today, I'm known for YouTube and my book, YouTube Secrets and all that stuff, but it's really video, right? I teach people cameras and lighting, how to, how to be on camera. The, the, the formation of that was just being in the trench, trenches and doing it for 10, 20,000 hours in the first, you know, 2003 to 2010, basically. Yeah, and, and, and thankfully, with books like this and the Think Media channel, you probably don't need to spend 10,000 hours. We can get through there a heck of a lot faster. I know you've helped me tremendously, Sean, uh, just from the content. It's, just, it's really, really solid. Um, lighting, too, by the way. We just talked about this briefly before we even started. Lighting is tough to get right. Um, so anyway, some so a little bit of YouTube can get you there. I'm curious, right? So you, you started producing all these videos, working with the church, putting the right habits in place, working out the right muscles. How did you actually convert that into a real business? Did you just like leave your day job and say, I'm going to go all in, I'm going to find clients. What did that transition look like to going full-time with video? Yeah, I love the question because this gets to kind of a interesting part of my story because I had a vision of course, to be full-time, do this full-time, but, but my transition side hustle, if you will, was waiting tables. So I was a, a waiter at Red Robin, which is a burger place here in America, a lot of locations. And I actually worked my way up. So I was a bus boy and a host. I was even the bird. They have a bird mascot I, well, a couple of times. <laughs> and eventually I was able to be the waiter and start waiting tables. And because I could do double shifts and put in 10, 12 hour days and get tips, I was able to really concentrate a baseline of income as uh, also I uh, got married young at 21. My wife was working multiple jobs. And so we kind of, she's Starbucks. So we're working in, in those like frontline service type jobs um, and then trying to build the business on the side. So I have just a total respect for the, the solopreneur and the side hustler. That's like, I want to build out you know, my online business of some kind, I want to work my way out of it, but it was definitely a process for me. And then what happened was we hit actually the craziest season of our life. 2009, my wife almost dies mm. and she had gotten sick a few years earlier on a, tr a trip she was in, in the Philippines. She came home and she started to throw up 10 to 15 times a day. And we didn't know what was going on and doctors didn't know what was going on. And so ye, this happened for a few years. Eventually she dropped down to 82 pounds and had to get a feeding tube installed in her J junum. That means, you know, the side of her abdomen and they placed it wrong. So the liquid that we first started to administer that first night started to fill up her body cavity, not her stomach. And that'll suffocate your organs and it'll kill you quick. So rushed her to the hospital and kind of to make a long story and an intense story short is we ended up in the hospital for six days. And so as a young aspiring entrepreneur, one, I'm like, God, why is this happening? But two, I'm like, what is it? What are we going to do? And again, I'm working at Red Robin. I was part time by this point, quarter time, actually, at my church getting paid like pennies. But I still was doing video for the church. And I started my business, Clear Vision Media, trying to pick up client work originally. Now, my wife had to stop working, rightly so. And so our income was devastated. And this was also the big short a couple years earlier. And so we were losing our house. And then the church actually fell apart. And I'm really a big believer that it's actually some, it's our hardest seasons and our highest pressure seasons and the seasons that almost kill us, that if they don't kill us, they make us stronger. And it, and it was in that season, in those six days in that hospital room, 
that there was a fire lit in me that was like, man, I got to man up. I got to step up. Like I was already trying, but it was a whole new level of focus and fight for my family that I really leaned into. And so I was like, okay, I got to make this side hustle thing work. And I wasn't trying to live the four hour work week lifestyle, Tim Ferriss. I wasn't trying to, you know, just crush it, live on, you know, work on a beach and, and create passive income. I wanted all of that, but I wanted it for my family. I wanted it to pay medical bills. I wanted it to take care of my wife. And I really am a big believer that reasons come first, results come second. Because entrepreneurship's freaking hard. I mean, you're listening to this right now. You're getting punched in the face. It's not going as fast as you want to. It's really discouraging. You know, when when am I going to get a break? Like, how long do I stay at this? Do I need to pivot? Do I need to quit? Start something new? But I just I believe reasons come first, results come second. And my reasons became my family and my faith and fighting for our future. And so I, I started to go all in. And that was a long journey to answer your question that what ended up happening was about two years of hustling. Um, uh, the church fell apart. I'm still waiting tables. I'm trying to get my business off the ground. We're in Seattle area. And I got an opportunity through starting a YouTube channel, a, a channel I never talk about. It's called Think International. We were doing like kind of faith based leaders and author interviews uh, still out there the other day, eventually grew to 10,000 subscribers. But that actually opened some doors to go work at a church in Las Vegas. And they invited me to be the director of communications. They it was a huge step up for me, a huge leadership step up, a huge life lesson step up. They had a TV show. They had multiple. The pastor had a pretty big personal brand. He's writing books. So really my formation years and everything I do today in terms of personal branding, books, content, media, like that was a very formation year. But the 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 key was it was a salary and it was health insurance. So even mm. though I had some money coming in, it was the practicality that in entrepreneurship, I think it's a good question everyone should ask, who's depending on you? Because look, if you're single, no kids, no wife, well then you might as well bet the farm and maybe I would, I could have just gone all in, slept on my friend's couch. But I was in a season where I had to think about my wife first and I knew I actually had an inner faith that my side hustle was gonna work. But as far as the time horizon, I went and took a full-time job as a, as a stability uh, and as a personal development. I believe every, uh, you know, that any season we should take jobs, not just for money, but also for growth. And, um, and then I kept hustling on the side. So it was about another five years in working for that church while working on YouTube as much as I could. And that meant it went slower, but I kept moving forward and I never lost that fire because I had a vision for what it could be for eventually having financial freedom as well as time freedom. And, and I, I, I believe I am a true entrepreneur because I wanted to be my own boss and, uh, and I was fighting for that, but I was also content and patient to really plug myself into a job that would support my family. Uh, and we could talk about how the numbers grew from there, but it was really 2010 to 2015 that um, I was working at that church, learning a ton, and then just kind of doing some side client work and working on my own YouTube stuff and developing a lot of the methodology that we now teach today. Well, listen, I'm, I'm very thankful that you shared that story because when we start our entrepreneurship journey, we, we kind of see all the positives, but time after time, again, converse, conversionalizing, which is a made up word, but I'm going to go with it anyway, conversionalizing time after time, again, conversionalizing with entrepreneurs, we recognize that typically when we get one problem, it's not one, it's seven all at the same time. And no matter what you're going through, it's probably not as challenging is what Sean just shared. That is super powerful. You sound, honestly, you sound like Job right now going from having God That's take away. That's funny, it was the Job season, no doubt about it. Like it all hit at once. <laughs> it all hits at once, but you know, I think if you can find the ways to persevere through it, it, it pays off. What I really like about what you did is you kind of positioned yourself in a place where you, you, you knew you had clarity on the direction that you wanted to go, video, in YouTube. And then you position yourself within a, a job, within an employment situation where you could continue to refine that craft. You know, I spent a decade plus in the insurance industry. There was no crossover between insurance and podcast media. And, uh, you know, that, that seems like a really smart transition to me, putting yourself in that position to, to really move. So talk to me a little bit more about 
when you recognize that, hey, I can go all in, I can do my own thing, I can pay all my own bills, what what was the catalyst moment for you, Sean, where you could leave your day job and focus solely on your business? Yeah, so that happened now in 2015, October. Um, and so after being a director of communication at the church for a few years, an opportunity opened to move from Las Vegas to Irvine, California to actually be a campus pastor. And we were going to do video venues. So that meant the we either played a recording or live stream the pastor in. And I was responsible for the day to day as well as like weddings and funerals and really taking care of people. Um, and I, I can't understate how formational those five years were, in fact, and I would almost say critical for who I am today. I mean, just as a side note, you know, now I have 22, 23 W two employees, um, a multimillion business, eight, eight figures, probably this year, top line. And it's, and I'm like, I'm a small town kid, college dropout. What am I even doing? Like, how do I, how do you run a team? Like, how do you, how do you, how are you, you know, how do you lead and all these kind of questions? But it was so, a lot of in those seasons, that was the skill set that was really being forged. But then what happened was um, we, we transitioned out of that because while I was doing it for about a year and a half in Irvine, eventually I talked to my boss who would have been the senior pastor and he said, how you doing? I said, I'm doing all right, but I kind of feel like, Michael Jordan playing baseball Mm. and, you know, sports analogies for him, like make total sense too. He's a huge sports guy. So he was like, I get it. You know, it's like, I could do it kind of because you're like, he's athletic, but you're never going to be, it's not the right fit for you. And so I had greater clarity that I was like, listen, media, marketing, social media, man, I'm obsessed. It's also, that's my jam. I'm a, I learned a lot of stuff from being a pastor and being in that kind of role, but, but this is the other thing that I'm really into. So he, um, I, I transitioned out of being on staff and they actually did hire me back to be a freelancer and manage some of his social media and doing some other stuff. So I picked up a couple clients and I picked up, um, the church and two other clients at $5,000 a month, moved back to Vegas with my wife, no kids at the time, and that's 60K a year, not bad. And then on YouTube, by this time, I'm probably making 80 to $100 a month in YouTube ad revenue. And affiliate marketing, where I talk about tech and I've got affiliate links, is generating another 50 to 100 bucks a month. And around the holidays, it's like 300 to 400. And so it's kind of a nice side income, but it's not great yet. And Think Media is probably around 10,000 subscribers, my main channel. So um, it's kind of cool to see I'm making uh, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month on the side, on top of the free, you know, the clients. And now it's life's kind of intense though, because servicing the clients is not like having three bosses. And then I'm trying to work on my (laughs) side hustle stuff. And so I'm still really grinding. And, and this is now 2015 for most of the year. Well, October, 2015 rolls around and I get a call from the church and they're like, listen, we're we're good now. You know, it's been a great run. We're hiring some staff. We got to let you go. So I was like, shoot, there goes $2,000 in my monthly income. Now the next week though, I get a second call and it was one of my other clients and they go, Hey, you know, we don't need your services anymore. Same kind of idea. We're actually going to in-house this. We don't want to work with the contractor. We got to let you go. Now I'm like, shoot, there's 4,000 of my monthly income gone. Third week, I get a call from my one other client. And sure enough, by this time, I've got so much fear and trepidation that I'm like, I know what this is about. You know what I mean? Like Murphy's law, (laughs) like if something's going to go bad, it's probably like you said, it's all going to go bad. And sure enough, he was like, yeah, uh, you're fired. And I was like, okay, great. Um, So we lost like 90% of our income in three weeks. Um, You know, a couple hundred bucks are coming in from online income. And we only have six months of savings before we're at zero. So we're really, you know, living in Vegas, cost of living's pretty good, but it's a pretty tight situation. So I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. And thank God for mentors. I call uh, a friend of mine who's a businessman who had a nice exit of a real estate online education business. So he has like no money problems. His name's David. He like, um, I call him, I'm like, David, listen, I know you know my story. I know you know what I'm doing. I just lost all my clients though, man. And I am, I'm worried, bro. And I will never forget because David's like, he goes, I'm not worried. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, I know. Like you're, you're like independently wealthy though. Like, what do you mean? That's the most insensitive thing you can, I'm not worried. No, I, I don't know if you heard me, David. I'm worried. Like I'm six months away from zero in my bank account and I just lost 90% of my income. I have no clients. 
Um, and, but I'm so glad he said that because, you know, sometimes you need somebody else in your life that has a vantage point that can see higher than your current circumstances. And so he was like, the reason I'm not worried is because in entrepreneurship, at some point you have to jump off the cliff, but it sounds like Sean, that God just kicked you off the cliff and now it's your time to fly. And I'm like, well, first of all, what are you like a rhyming, le- you know, leprechaun? Like what it was the most, le- most proverbial, just like a proverb. That's it's your time to fly, son. You know, I'm like, what? <laughs> but I was like, um, I, I was so grateful he said that because it, it ultimately was true. I think I did have a lot of even still imposter syndrome, um, you know, afraid of really going all in, not client work, but just like being like some of my heroes and just creating my own products or making income in the creator economy, YouTube ad revenue and just scaling it up. So I, I went all in and now this is towards the end of October. Admittedly, I took about a week to be like, okay, you know, Netflix and like Breaking Bad all four seasons in a row. But, you know, after that week, I was like, I got to grind. And so I started to work 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. This is now October, November. This is no uh, October, September, October, November. So this would have been November, December. We're going into November, the last two months of the year of 2015. And I know what to do. The good news and David's encouragement was I I knew how to rank videos. I knew YouTube was a search engine. I knew what affiliate marketing was. I knew how to make videos. I was incredibly uh, systematized and I had deployed all my energy towards three other clients. So it actually was a moment once my mindset changed since that time, Mark, I actually feel like I've been playing house money, even though I had no money. Since that time, I feel like it's been Christmas every day because it was actually the liberation moment. Even though the money wasn't coming in, I was like, I have no bosses now. Like, this is on me. And when I really made that switch, I just got so pumped. And I and it was, you know, they, sometimes they say you'll give up your nine to five to become an entrepreneur and work from five to nine. <laughs> And I was kind of what it was. I'd be getting up at like 5 a.m. and grinding until 9 or 10 at night and doing it every single day. Of course, that's not sustainable long term, but it's absolutely sustainable. A lot of startup, you know, people know that that's just sometimes what it is. And so I just started hustling 24 seven. Yeah, I did sleep, but, you know, uh, not a lot for those two months. And the timing couldn't have been better. God's plan. It was Black Friday, Cyber Monday. I'm a tech YouTuber. I teach video. I review cameras. And so holiday shopping shoots up and spending shoots up. And so I I published, I I did a whole presentation about this, 52 videos in two months. I shot on myself, edited on myself, thumbnail myself. At the time I was making blog posts, trying to rank the blog posts, metadata, um, scripted them, did the research, you know, filmed, edited, uploaded in the two months. And then January, here was the result. So from Amazon affiliate program, which was, there was a couple others, but that was the main thing. You know, I talk about cameras, what's the best holiday camera deals or whatever. People click on my links. In January of now 2016, I got my Amazon check. Now it is three months delayed, but this was the amount earned, was like $4,500. And then my YouTube ad revenue during that season had jumped up about $300. So I had almost replaced the five grand that I lost from the freelance clients now from online income. But what's crazy is YouTube also is the compound effect because it's not like I, the way I make videos is not uh, is so they have a long shelf life. I do make some that are kind of time based, news based, trend based. But YouTube is a search engine. So I'm always playing the long, long, long game like real estate. I've got videos that are 10 years old, five years old that are still getting views. So it's not only the hustle that I put into them, but it's the mindset saying I view every YouTube video I post like an employee that I pay once that then works for me for free for weeks, months and years to come. So when I do a YouTube video right and I invest all that energy, it's not like this cycle of I got to grind forever. YouTube is leverage. YouTube is liberation. The only reason I am where I am today, thank God, is YouTube itself. Of course, all the things around that, but because I was able to continue to work myself out of the job, creating passive income and income that was on autopilot so I could work on the next thing, hire the next person, 
do something else like write a book, do something else like build an event, do something else like build a course. But all that to say was, um, yeah, we're going into 2016 and now I was like, wow, the base has been covered, but this is just gonna compound. So I didn't start stop in January, February, March. I haven't stopped since. Of course, today, now we have two kids. Um, we do have an incredible work-life balance. Um, it, we're on year six or seven in in terms of, you know, 2016 to 2022. It's been about six years and things have grown up. And of course, once you get into, I, I believe one of mindset for those listening too is you do gotta think bigger and you do you gotta blow up. Like meaning, I think the solopreneur thing is a myth. I, I think that ultimately mm. you're gonna cru- you're gonna get crushed by the market, and you're also just gonna get crushed in your health if you don't scale up and start thinking bigger in terms of revenue, thinking bigger in terms of hiring, thinking bigger in, in building a team. I would only have, I think, the sanity and health that I have today had I thought bigger. And so from that time, it was just constant reinvestment of money, constant reinvestment of all profit back into the business and uh, and scaling up from there. But anyways, uh, 2016 was really kind of when it all happened. And uh, in that first year, um, we actually did about 180K in revenue top line um, from 2016 to 2017. I mean, this is the power of scalability of, of YouTube really. And that, so I, I want to go back to, cause you, you made a few good points there, Sean. So a, I've been reading through your, your new book, YouTube secrets, uh, the revised second edition here. Cause we know that the internet's always changing. So we got a fresh new version out and uh, you can see I had a bunch of cliff notes here. It's, it's basically the instruction manual. If you just start, start it from, from top to bottom, you, you you, know, you, you, you and Benji as well, Benji Travis, who's been on the show as well, you lay down the entire formula here. So A, I just, shameless plug, this is, this is something you wanna check out. And by the way, I have affiliate links that I learned from Sean down below. So you can go buy the book and at no additional cost to you. You help me, you help Sean, you help yourself. So with that said, <laughs> there is something that you had mentioned, Sean, that I just wanna highlight for a moment, because this is something that, that me and my wife found out quickly. I have two young kids, three and six. Um, and I was talking to my wife about this just the other day and she's like, Mark, I thought when you left your job, that was just going to mean you had a lot of free time. Mm. And I was like, uh, that's not exactly how it works. I have more freedom of time, but it's not just like hours and hours just happen. I'm just curious and you know, you don't have to, to get too open, but did you have a conversation like that with your wife about, Hey, this is how I want to spend my time. This is how we need to prioritize. This is how we can time block. Did you? Did you have any sort of conversation like that? Um, that's a great question. And I think it was most clearly illustrated uh, for me through actually some conversations with friends and other couples that were getting married around us because, um, man, I just love my wife. My wife's name is Sonia. And we did get married at 21. And so now we've been married 17 years. We just celebrated our 17th anniversary. Pretty wild because your brain's not even fully developed at 21. You know, you're you're still changing as a person. And there's been a lot of ups and downs, man. Like even our first marriage, I'm surprised we made it. Like it was it was intense. Like if we had a bed in like some counseling and and just perseverance and just committed sure. to each other and committed to a bigger vision and a bigger faith than how we were feeling in the moment. But uh, what was... You know, uh, we had, she definitely knew who I was. We had like stated principles and kind of core values and vision, but it was sort of like a grit and like a tenacity and kind of like this mindset that she had because it wasn't even just 2016 when I went all in. It was the fact that the church in Irvine demanded a ton from me and then I would come home and work more because I was trying to build up the side hustle. And so it was, I think the key was we, we, we believed in the same vision. We had a, we believed in this principle that I heard from Dave Ramsey that says live today like no one else so that later in life you can live and give like no one else. So, you know, a lot of this was in my twenties, especially. Um, and then from about, you know, 30, 32 to 37, like the last five years, just last four years, like really hustling in the last two, still like really committed to the business. But we and we've been super blessed. I think the kids thing's a huge piece because of the health challenges. And by the way, you know, she's doing amazing today. There's this device called a gastric stimulator, which is like a pacemaker for your stomach because she had gastroparesis. It's a paralysis of your stomach through doctors, through prayer, through perseverance. It's even a miracle Two miracle babies. We have two boys 
like it was doctors are astounded. It's, it's wild. But for a lot of a lot of people, if they're going to have kids, they maybe had them earlier. And I have massive empathy. If you're in the startup mode and like the early grind startup mode of your business and you've got like young kids. So we've had kids in the last two years, but we had a stability of revenue and of a team around us. And so but in those other in those early days, the, I think the key is live today like no one else. It's sacrifice. It's there's a sacrifice season. And she was willing to make that sacrifice. And she's grateful today. So we had absolutely conversations. Hey, what are we giving up today so we can reach a vision that we share together that we want for tomorrow? And to come back to bringing up conversations with friends, we had a, we had a couple that uh, a, a guy I've known for a long time, we've worked together, he was starting a new business. And they also had a new baby. And his wife was talking to my wife saying like, man, like, how do you, uh, how do you handle it when Sean's like working all the time or, <laughs> you know, how do you handle it when he's just not like home or done at like five for dinner? And I think the, the, the key was, she was like, what do you mean? <laughs> she was like, this is, she, she, she knew exactly what she meant, but she was like, this is a cost of entry. Like she was like, wait, this, if you guys are going to build something like this is what it is. Like, what, what do you mean? Like, I, I'm like, you know, he, that's what he's got to do. And, and not, maybe not forever, or maybe can we communicate about it? Of course, uh, a certain thing you have to be at a certain function or a certain evening where you're committed to date nights and you got to do practical things. Um, but I think that I'm just so grateful. And, and part of it was communicated. And part of it, I feel like was just God's blessing, or you could call it luck was that she was just wired to uh, to be able to handle that. For the person listening, I wouldn't want you to feel like you're in a hard spot. You either one go, well, shoot, that's not my wife. And I think family is is really everything. I think you have to you have to get on the same page as a couple. Um, and I and one advice I'd give to some people, I think some entrepreneurs like me, they could be so ambitious. I, I don't think you want your ambition to push so hard that you leave your family behind. I think that you'd be surprised that you know, what you hope happens in three years could actually happen in seven and you don't have to sacrifice your family or your health to get there. And sometimes people are rushing a little too fast. I think I myself have, have, have made that mistake a lot. Um, but on the flip side, this also goes, if you're single, like marry the right one, like try to be as, you know, get, sit down, have hard conversations and, and get on the same page about what it means to be an entrepreneur or a business owner. Um, and then and then one other maybe fix on either side is get your partner around people who think different because it's gonna be a real problem if, if your wife, let's say, is hanging out with friends and they're like, yeah, that does suck. Yeah, he is never home. Yeah, you, are, you, <laughs> aren't, you, you definitely aren't being treated well. Like you all, you know, you want him around some people that are like, that's cool what you guys are building. Thank God he's, he's out there grinding. Man, that's amazing that, that he's putting in the work. What are you guys working towards? Here's what we're working towards. How's it going? It's going good. We're saving up money. It looks like, you know, and, and then you have communication. I quote, we all want it to happen sooner than it probably does. But again, a, a th one, two, three, four, five strategic years can get for you the opportunity to, you know, we'll probably take four or five weeks off this year where we're dark. We, we have two houses. We live in Seattle and Vegas. We split our time based as a family thing, but also as an investment property thing, as well as um, just freedom and flexibility to be out of the Vegas sun. Um, you know, said, said with empathy or just with self-awareness, like we could kind of do whatever we want, you know, in terms of uh, our time and, and finances and travel and choices. And so, and, and there's been a ton of freaking sacrifice. Cause I mean, on the one hand, all kinds of different people listening to this, I know I'm 39. So you might be like, you're super young, bro. And you might be 21. You're like, dear God, I don't want to put in 20 years. So, so it's just, all I know is, you know, everyone's journey and timeline's different. Uh, but I can tell you this today, my wife's pumped, you know, she's grateful, financially liberated. Um, and it took a lot of freaking sacrifice to get there. So we were bought in on the vision and, uh, and, and it was not without problems. I mean, that's everything. I mean, you see inside any couple's life, 
there's definitely times where you, you probably push it to the breaking point and you should have even, you forget to text and it was, you went three, four or five hours later or you were traveling or whatever. And, and it was like, you'd even call me and like, so, so you got to work through it as you go. But if you pick the right one and at least you're unified in the big vision, I think that can carry you a really, um, it could carry you far. I mean, I feel like you've got like, a, I'm going to check my home for video cameras because I feel like a lot of the stuff you're talking about is happening on my side. And, you know, one thing, you know, one thing that I've actually started doing is writing little post-its, putting them on the mirror at night just to let my wife know, hey, you didn't see me last night, you know, because of our schedules, but I'm still here. I'm still thinking about you. And that even just that small habit has made a big difference um, in, in what we do. And also, of course, reverse engineering it. This is where we want to go. This is the vision. How are we going to get there? You know, because there's certain habits in your life that are going to, they just, it just, they just don't align with that vision. And, and then lastly, and this kind of segues into my next question. One of the most common questions that I get a big point in the book that I just, I feel like we need to highlight is limiting beliefs. Hmm. I, I will not, to, I just won't tolerate. I will not tolerate limiting beliefs in my life. I cannot have it. Won't have it. It, it is, it, it, it's like sucks the air out of you while you're trying to run a marathon. It doesn't work. And one of the, one of the symptoms that you get from limiting beliefs is imposter syndrome, mm. right? I hear it's all the time. Mark, I don't like the way I sound. Nobody's going to watch. I don't, you know, this isn't going to work. So what did, you know, what do you do? What do you say? You've worked with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, Sean, what do you say to someone who says, I'm not good enough. I'm concerned. I'm no one's going to watch. I suffer from imposter syndrome. What do you say? Yeah, I think um, the first thing you need to know if you feel like you're suffering from imposter syndrome is you're not alone. I think everyone who's ever got on camera deals with that to, to one degree or another. Um, and like any discipline or industry, um, the difference between someone who's doing it right now and the person who's not doing it is the person who's doing it, did it and is doing it. And that might seem over simplified, but it's like they just did it scared. So I heard the definition of courage, uh, a definition or the definition is, uh, you know, doing something despite the fear that you feel. And so courage is not the absence of fear. It's the possession of fear and the decision to do the thing anyways. So if you feel like an imposter, imposter, do it anyways. If you feel like kind of awkward on camera, upload the video anyways. If you feel like, man, that kind of sucked and I was stumbling over my words, I'm not going to flatter you. It probably did suck and you were stumbling over your words. Upload it anyways. The wrong mindset is the mindset that thinks anybody is good when they first start something. There's a really good book by Seth Godin called The Dip. And it's about you when you start something new, you're pumped. You're as this when you start the new business, you're like, this is what it could be, and this is what it could do for our family, and this is gonna be amazing. And maybe I can imagine the accolades I'm gonna get, and I'm excited about the idea, and I'm excited about solving this problem and serving this customer, and I'm so excited to run something on my own. That's how everybody starts. And in every industry, you wanna get in shape, you wanna start a YouTube channel, you wanna start your business, you're gonna hit the dip. And so it's probably about 14 minutes after the dopamine wears off. You're, you're now like, here we are in the roller coaster of like, this is not going to work. I'm probably going to fail. There's no money coming in. Oh my gosh, there's a recession looming. We're in the middle of a recession. Look at all these layoffs happening. You know, my back hurts. I'm freaking exhausted. Um, you know, there's no way I can sustain this. That happens about 14 minutes after, and that's usually the consistent emotional state for us as entrepreneurs. I actually think the highs are a lot more uh, rare than the lows. Um, humor me for a slight rabbit trail. There's a, there's a great book called Attri uh, Attributes, and it's actually about um, not like skills uh, or personality traits even, but attributes 
Um, and it goes really into the discipline of those in the military. And I think even Navy SEALs, I think it's written by a Navy SEAL. And his definition in the chapter on resilience rocked me because the way he was describing resilience was just how quick do you get back to baseline? So it was, you're gonna go to a high high and what can happen as entrepreneurs, you get cocky, you get prideful or you get complacent, you start blowing money um, and that's a problem. If you go to a high high, you gotta get back to baseline quick. Le real leaders, it's just back to baseline. You also mm. go through a low low, lose a client, get punched in the face, you know, financially, having a real hard season in your relationship with your partner, your marriage, you're just back to baseline. You, you might have that be happening downstairs, we work from home, but I gotta walk upstairs, close my door, and I still gotta get back to work and get on a podcast and produce or like finish the to-dos. Resilience, you gotta get back to baseline. And so it, that was what I would encourage people feeling like an imposter. It's like, you just gotta do it and you learn by doing. Everybody sucks at the start. And once you put in the reps and the repetition of making videos, putting content out there, and then I would, one other thing is I'd say, you're also, you're for sure overthinking it. Like I promise you, you're overthinking it. You probably know you're overthinking it, but you're really overthinking it. Because what you're thinking too, is you're thinking, oh man, I suck on camera. Oh man, that shirt makes me look fat. Oh man, like that, why is that lighting so bad? Why is my sweat beating up on my forehead? Okay, I don't sound as good as this compares. You're thinking about all this stuff. But here's what the viewer's thinking. The viewer is just thinking about themselves. They're not overly judgmental of the content they're consuming. What they're looking for, especially for most of your audience entrepreneur wise, is they're just looking for answers. So you're overly worried about the camera and the lighting and all this other stuff when what the viewer ultimately wants is they just want their problem solved. So the best way to start a YouTube channel, especially as a business owner, is knowing your who and your what. Who is this content for? Um, and what problem does it solve? Entrepreneurs solve problems for a profit. So what problem am I solving and how am I doing that with content? So when someone finds you and you state maybe a problem, you agitate a problem that they feel, are you frustrated because your tax bill is high, too high at the end of the year? Let's say you're a CPA creating content. And the person's like, I am frustrated. Do you wanna, do you wanna know the top five tax strategies for saving money? Um, and so the hook grabs the right audience because who you help is business owners that want to figure out taxes and save money on taxes. And then you deliver some good information, like as long as it's audible and it's somewhat coherent, especially, and here's the key, if it just solves the problem, then you're going to create so much goodwill in the process, no matter what you look like, what you sound like, and maybe your skill set is not ready at that moment to really scale to the masses, but it's absolutely ready at the moment you're listening to this to get a few new clients, to get your to get your confidence up, to start creating content, to start building your brand. Like you can make progress on the way. The progress has not got to be that far out, especially for business owners. A lot of them are like, I go, how many new clients do you even really need? They're like three a month. I'm like, so why are you trying to go viral? Like if you need three <laughs> clients, just you don't need to do much. And so, so I think you're overthinking it. And then ultimately you got to just start. You cannot steer a parked car. And once you start now, you could be like, okay, cool. I, I should turn the air conditioning lower. So I don't have those sweat beads on my head. All right, cool. This color doesn't really look good on me. I'm gonna wear this color instead. That stuff really doesn't matter, but you can change all that stuff. Cause now the car is moving. So you start tweaking it. All right, now I'm going to level up my camera setup. Now I'm going to, you know, do this. I'm going to do this other stuff. It's one step at a time. And just like you learned the skill set of skill set of your primary business, you did not learn that overnight. You were an imposter in that at one time. What is what's uncomfortable is you're learning something new. It's uncomfortable to go into a new territory like YouTube to see competitors out there who are already doing it. Who cares? Like the world is so big. There's 3.6. Uh, there's 2.6 billion monthly active users on YouTube. That's one third of the planet. And your target customers there, your target audience is there. Um, the competition is rising, but consumption's even bigger. And so there's endless clients, customers, revenue opportunity that's on YouTube and it's there for the taking your piece of the piece of the piece of really an unlimited pie from just starting and all your messiness and all of your imposter syndrome, you got to just start. And so that's kind of what I would say to, to someone who's maybe overthinking and just hesitating from getting on camera, 
punch fear in the face and press record. That's, that's what I was looking for. That punch fear in the face and press record. I still, I say that all the time and I, I give you credit for it, by the way. Cause it's, well, I appreciate that. I actually stole the punch fear in the face thing from my friend, John Acuff. It's in the title of his book uh, start, but then the press record, it just flows so well. I think I said, uh, and what I said was punch fear in the face, punch perfectionism in the face and press record. So by adding 66% to it, I, I hope my friend John <laughs> is okay with the theft of that really poignant phrase. Well, it's true. That idea of you cannot park, a, you cannot steer a parked car. It makes so much sense. You just, you got to start in. You know, I, there was a video that I recorded because this is something that I encourage people to do, but also be ready, be scared. If you watch a video that you recorded a year, two years ago, you're like, holy crap, I was terrible. I still do that. But th even those videos that were terrible, the lighting stunk, my microphone was like 10 feet from my face, you know, I it just a hot mess. It still generates income. It's still there. It's still generating income. People don't we, we're always comparing ourselves to like the top of the top, but most people just, they, they don't care. They just want their problem solved. I think that's a really poignant topic, really poignant. I want to get to the rapid fire here, Sean. Again, we just barely even touch. We just been talking about entrepreneurship and video baby, but the YouTube secrets book, it's like a dollar on Kindle or something like it's super cheap. It's going to give you the exact steps you can take to make this happen. There was one other myth. I at least want to just point out here, Sean, um, that I also get asked a lot when working with clients. Um, and it's that, this idea that someone took my idea. It, the market is too saturated. I can't do a, a video. I can't do a channel. I can't run a podcast on that topic. But what I found out, and you know this as well as I do, and this is your answer in the book is, if nobody's doing it, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. There's a, if nobody's doing it, that's a problem. Yeah, it's, it's, um, there's a, Pop, there's an important business term that business owners and entrepreneurs need to know, and it's TAM, T-A-M. And it stands for Total Addressable Market. And so if you were doing market research and you were starting a new endeavor, you're asking how much potential in this market is there? This is why they might say the, you know, the health and wellness industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry. And you get the specific numbers. This is why it's interesting that the creator economy Forbes said, um, was valued at, at the beginning of the year at 20 billion. And it's estimated to be 104.2 billion by the end of 2022. So that's five X growth. So you go, okay, like, uh, in my case, actually being an individual that serves creators, it's not like I'm working on the typewriter and the PC is about to come here. We're literally in a wave. <laughs> this next decade is going to be the best decade on YouTube and in the creator economy in general. It'll continue to evolve from there, but no doubt about it. Like we're in a moment. So that's, that's your market saying that I think it's important to consider, like you said, if there's a lot of competition, that's a lot of times a good thing. And then your second question, though, is there it is possible for there to be saturation. That's why the book, The Blue Ocean Strategy is important. That also could be a positioning of uh, their where do you position yourself in the market? Because different is better than better. But all that to say is that it's not too crowded. Like for if you're listening to this and even if in all your research, you probably are still just doing mental gymnastics to like keep yourself from really just stepping out and going for it. it like in a, in a six, seven billion people on the planet world. And because of the internet with like half of those people now, it's like literally 4 billion are on the internet with at least mobile devices. Like there is so much abundance and potential. And I like to think about it like this, you know, I grew up in Seattle, um, North of Seattle in a rural community. Coffee is major in Seattle. Starbucks, home of Starbucks, Seattle's best coffee. And on every corner, there's also an espresso stand, like literally, especially in Marysville, Washington, where I grew up. And, and one reason why is because people are commuting to work and there might be two across from each other because it's got to be the easy right turn in and the easy right turn out. They're not going to cross traffic during the busiest times. So if you think about it, you could look at one thing and say, man, should I open up a coffee shop? There's already coffee shops everywhere. But what happens is there's always new coffee shops. Why? Because people drink coffee. It's kind of mm. like, should I open up a restaurant? I don't know. I think the, I think the food market, people eating food, but food is tapped out. I don't know if people are going to keep <laughs> eating food either. It's tapped out. Like, what are you talking about? Like, no, there's always an opportunity for having a niche when it comes to opening up a new restaurant, having a certain way you're doing it or location positioning. 
You know, it's like, should I write a book? And no doubt about it. There's a lot of books being written, but it's like, no, all the books have been written or all the books have been read and no one's reading new books. And despite here's what's also pe- a, a problem is people are making a lot of judgments, actually not knowing the research because they think about what did they do? You're listening to this. And if you're listening to this, you probably are a reader because uh, leaders are readers, but maybe you're not. And maybe you're more podcasts and everything else. So you go, oh, do people even read books anymore? Yeah, the numbers are going up. There's this whole thing called book talk on TikTok. Barnes and Noble is opening stores. And not only that, audiobooks are exploding because podcasts are exploding. And so it's never been more abundant in the market. If you think about someone like me, you might not buy books, but I buy an excessive amount of books and more than I could ever read. It's like a weird, I, there, there's there's this term called a bibliophile, which is actually, and then there's, there's a term that actually speaks to like this toxic addiction <laughs> to buying and collecting books that actually <laughs> hinders your personal relationships. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Uh, and so, so it's not like I also just bought one book. I buy hundreds of books and, and also as an author, but it's something I'm obsessed with. Partly not even, I like to support people who launch books. I like to hold it. I like to read it. I like to research them. Sometimes I just want to get one nugget out of it, see what they were doing. I like to read the acknowledgements and all these weird things that might not be you. It doesn't matter. I'm out here buying books. So is it, is there consumers for this particular topic? Online courses. Somebody already made an online course on that. I have bought 50 marketing courses like we buy in our company, we buy online courses all the time. We buy online courses. We, have, we basically have an unlimited education budget for our team in our company. They can buy whatever books they want, whatever courses they want, um, because we're committed to sharpening the ax, sharpening the saw, leveling up, learning. The best investment you could ever make is in yourself. And we practice what we preach and we're always learning. What's the point? So, so you go, well, someone already has a YouTube channel on that. The question becomes, is there an audience for it? The question becomes, is there consumers for it? And if there is, then it's a good thing that there's competition and you should start. And one final reason of why you should specifically start on YouTube is YouTube is actually looking for clusters of a particular type of person in a particular audience. Here's what I mean. You might say, well, there's already a bunch of soccer channels. Do you know how many football fans there are in the world? Yeah, unlimited. So. If there's people who are watching soccer channels, highlight channels, tips of how to get better at soccer, what the YouTube algorithm does is it studies your consumption be a behavior of the viewer. It starts building a profile around you and Google owns YouTube. So even Google has an entire profile around you. Google sees you searching when you're logged in for soccer clothes or soccer stats or soccer, whatever you go over to YouTube, Google has that information. So even your homepage can be recommending soccer content to you. So if you figure out your angle on things, and also if you figure out that there's channels with millions of subscribers, the practicality of you growing a channel to 10,000 subscribers with some decent soccer content is like the lowest hanging fruit on planet Earth right now. The long tail opportunity, maybe not to be the top 10 channels of soccer, but to even build a channel that spits out $32,000 a year um, talking about soccer is, is more real today than it ever has been before. So what happens is when you actually join a proven niche where there is competition and you bring something to that niche, YouTube will recommend your content. Once it starts to understand that your channel is about golf or entrepreneurship or about cars or about biohacking or about supplements or about taxes or about drama and, and about you know trending news or about politics, like, The way the algorithm works is it finds people who love consuming political content and then your your video with the right title and the right thumbnail on the right topic with the right content at the right time gets uploaded and boom, one of your videos pops off, hits a million views. Just by being monetized, you you can get a couple thousand dollars off of that instance and that is so common. Like, I know it might, uh, of course, the guy who wrote the book, YouTube Secrets on the podcast is gonna like over, (laughs) I wanna under hype it. But I just, we work with our students all day, every day, and every single day on our staff meeting, our standing meeting, virtually, we we share wins. And it's just shocking how much abundance there is. It, what I think that you went all the way back to limiting beliefs, the, the fixed pie mindset 
Um, the zero sum mindset is one of the most toxic beliefs that people have. They just think because somebody else has something, I can't have it as well. And even that mindset, while maybe that even could be true on Facebook, although it's not, we're blowing up organically on Facebook. Maybe that could be true on maybe a certain platform that they don't evolve the platform. It hits a cap. It does hit a limit. I don't want to deny that there isn't ever like market saturation. YouTube is one of the most generous channels. If you're doing it right, you have some smart strategy, so, some smart, some unique angles on the way you're doing things, but you do join a conversation that everyone else is already having. Channels that are starting at, at zero are one of our students, Larry, in six months, he went with 11 videos. He went from zero to 53,000 subscribers um, in person. By the way, in finance, you want to talk about wow. crowded, like personal wow. finance, finance stocks. It couldn't be more crowded, but we underestimate how many people there are. Consumption is bigger than competition right now. The demand to watch more and consume more is bigger. Real estate, loan officers. You want to talk about crowded real estate. New channels are closing deals, growing their business, growing their real estate education company, whether it's the investor side or whatever. Like, it's pretty shocking. So to your point, yeah, somebody stole my idea. Good. The key is not even the idea. The key is just your angle on the idea. Because listen, real estate is taken. Entrepreneurship is taken. YouTube tips is taken. But there's massive space. There's new people popping up every day teaching YouTube tips. I'm like, I'm here for it. Like that's, it's an abundant world. It's not a zero sum game. This is an unlimited abundant game. And that's not hype. That's the internet. That's the expansion of technology and communication. And that's also the embrace, the embracing of diversity. The final piece I'd say is no one can ever steal your idea because it's not about the idea. It's about the person presenting the idea. Because a lot of people are talking about real estate, but not everyone is necessarily an ethnic, ethnic female. Your vibe will attract your tribe. Your age, your ethnicity, your style of communication, this is a big one, your actual belief system. Some people want to actually follow, in fact, not some people, people want to follow people with shared beliefs. Simon Sinek did who, not how. Uh, no, he did the, uh, you know, what, how, who, uh, start with why. He did why mixed up two books there. So your why come, people want to follow people that have a common why. So it's like, I want to follow a real estate agent. Uh, I'll learn from anybody, but if I really resonate with somebody, I'm like, man, we share the same ethics. We share the same values. You're my guy. You're my girl. So when people are afraid to get in the game, they look at somebody else who's done it. And by the way, even if there is someone who looks literally exactly like you, there's not enough of you yet to even service the demand in the market, but that's where it gets interesting. I'm 39. Somebody else wants to learn YouTube tips from somebody that's 19, and they're coming from a whole different perspective with a whole two decades of different illustrations, different songs, different movies, different pop culture references. It's a whole different era. So, so there's definitely no excuse that someone took my idea. That's a good thing. It's time to be you and go all in on that idea in your unique way. I could not say it any better myself. And I had an interview with Jasmine Starr about a year ago. And, and out of 250 episodes, I Jasmine brought so much energy and so much Jasmine to the show that really cemented that to me. Because previously I was... I felt very stiff with, with everything I was doing. I was kind of like Tom Brokaw style, like this is the way it goes. But when I saw her and I saw the reaction that her audience had when she brought her energy and her life and her vibe, she attracted the right tribe. The vibe attracts the tribe is, someone has said that before. I don't know who that, who that was. Um, all right, cool. So before I let Sean go, just a couple of quick rapid fire questions for you. You gotta make sure you pick up the book down below and uh, head over to thinkmedia.com. That's thinkmedia.com. Dot com. All right, cool, Sean. I know we got to get you out of here. Quick question. Here we go. Scariest movie you've ever seen? I don't know. I mean, I it's been a long time since I've watched a scary movie. Um, I was I was trying to go deep and like present some movie that's not scary, but like it's scary because it presented factual information. I, maybe I would do that. Uh, like I don't know, one of those movies about food or something like Super Size Me, I think would be the scariest movie I've ever seen because it's the truth about what we put in our bodies and that it matters. I'll take it. I'll take it. If you could be any animal, what would you be? 
I mean, a lion is just what comes to mind at first. I don't know. It's kind of a masculine answer, and I'm not even really that guy, but uh, let's go with lion. I'll give it to you. You got the lion beard going, so that works. Uh, if yeah. you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Yeah, I think we, we would live on the West Coast, and so we already feel like we do. We live in Seattle and Las Vegas, and uh, we've been talking a little bit about Utah, Colorado. I, I think for sure we're, we're West Coast is the best coast type of people, and those are our spots. Cool. Final question here. If you had 10 seconds with yourself 10 years ago, what would you say? I'd say don't neglect your health. Um, I be, I'm dealing with repetitive stress injury, um, car, kind of carpal tunnel type syndrome uh, type stuff. And uh, it's just from grinding at a laptop with bad ergonomics or, and computer for a long time and not taking breaks um, and not doing strength training. Thank God for uh the momentum I'm experiencing now through physical therapy, uh, through this treatment I did called Regenix. Um, but I, I pushed it a little too hard and maybe it's not that I pushed it too hard. It's that, listen, if you're listening to this, you got to work out, you got to move, you got to lift heavy things. You got to take your health seriously because it is not worth it to have some short-term wins in a matter of years and to give up, um, you know, your health in the later of the life. I know I'm going a little long, but I'm deeply passionate about this. I think, um, you know, what they say is that a lot of uh, people spend their entire life uh, trying to make money. And then at the end of the life, they would spend any at the sacrifice of their health. And then at the end of the life, they'd spend any amount of money to get their health back. So just don't push it that hard. I think uh, make sure that you're really taking care of yourself along the way. Um, and uh, that was what I would tell myself 10 years ago. Very well said. John, thanks for joining the After Hours Entrepreneur. Boom. Thanks for listening today. I hope you garnered some wisdom from Sean and my own story. I, I, I just, I feel very connected to what Sean is doing. His, the way he is helping people just like you. Uh, check out his channel. Check out the book. I'm telling you, it is bananas. I am not just saying that. I have read through it. And uh, there's, it just, it breaks down the exact framework that you need to be successful on YouTube and to grow it out. So without further ado, thank you so much for subscribing. I am committed to making sure that you reach that first six figure year. That's what we do here on the After Hours Entrepreneur. Go out action taker. You can listen, you can learn. And now my friend, it's time for you to take the action and make it happen. I'll catch you next time here on the show. Peace.